branches. Luke chapter 17 began this two weeks ago. I want to finish up today. In Luke chapter 17, we have the account in verse 11 where Jesus healed ten lepers. What a great day when you get your leprosy healed. What a great day when you had a death sentence, but Jesus changed it to a life sentence. All right, it's a great day. Luke chapter 17, verse 11, And it came to pass, as he, Jesus, went to Jerusalem, that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered into a certain village, there met him ten men that were lepers, which stood afar off. According to the Jewish custom and law, if you had leprosy, you could not approach someone who was clean. You had to yell, unclean, unclean, so that you would not infect everyone else. These men were, were together because of circumstances. They were, they were together, maybe not before in life, but because of their leprosy, now they were comrades. And they called out to the one, verse number 13, who, had a, who, who they knew had a sliver of hope to heal them. There was no one else, no one else they could have called out to that could have healed them. They couldn't call out to a local priest. They couldn't call out to their dad or their mom or some ancestor or through some idol worship. The only one who could heal them was Jesus himself. I imagine in speculation on this passage, they had heard about Jesus. Why else would they have done this? They had heard about what he had done, how people who couldn't walk now could walk. People who couldn't see now could see. People who had issues of blood didn't have it any longer. People who were dead are now no longer dead. They believe there's a chance. There's a chance if we can just get his attention. We're not allowed to get real close, but if we can get his attention, there's a chance that this leprosy will be taken care of. Verse 13, they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When it says they lifted up their voices, how loud do you think they cried out? If this was your one chance, Jesus was coming by your certain village. You have a death sentence, but there's a, there's a man, the Son of God, who could heal you. How loud would you cry out? Oh, Jesus, Jesus, have mercy. Are you kidding me? It'd be louder than any, any fan at a football game. It'd be louder than any mother who watched their daughter get hurt in a soccer game. It'd be louder than any Black Friday line where someone takes the last thing that you want. It'd be crazy loud, would it not? Would you not scream until your voice was hoarse to get Jesus' attention? Can I just pause here real quick before we continue on? When you pray, do you lift up your voice to Jesus? How much urgency is there when you pray? Because when you pray, you can boldly approach the throne of grace. You can boldly approach God. You have access to Jesus all over again. And I'm afraid that we, if the lepers approached Jesus like we do in prayer, he never would have heard them. Lord, can you solve this? Okay, I'm on my way. Come on now. You hear what I'm saying? They lift up their voices. Jesus, Master, I bet they were screaming their heads off, embarrassing other people. Verse number 14, and when he saw them, he said unto them, Go show yourselves unto the priests. And it came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. We'll deal with this in a little bit. But understand, they were not healed until they obeyed. As they went, they were cleansed. Jesus healed in, in, in a multiplicity of different ways. Sometimes he healed by speaking. Sometimes he healed by touching. Sometimes he healed with mud. Sometimes he healed, healed from close. Sometimes from far away. But this is the one account that I see where obedience was required for healing. One other place he told the, the lame man to stand up and walk caused obedience. But this one said they were not healed until they went, as they went. Not right when they went, but as they went. They took that step to show their leprosy-ridden bodies. And somewhere that looked down and their finger was not affected any longer. Maybe the one guy looked at his friend, hey, hey, your nose. It's there. Hey, look, your face. It's like a baby's skin. Can you imagine the joy that they felt? Verse 15, and one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back and with a loud voice glorified God. 
Remember that they lifted up their voices to call upon God. And when he thanked God, he did it with a, help me here, a loud voice. Well, Pastor Howell, I'm thankful on the inside. I'm so thankful that, that you won't even tell I'm thankful. That's how thankful I am. Not this man. Not this man. He wanted everyone else to know what Christ had done for him. He fell on his face at his feet, giving him thanks, and he was a Samaritan. And Jesus answering said, Were there not ten cleansed, but where are the nine? They are not found that return to give glory to God. Save this stranger. And he said unto him, Arise, go thy way. Thy faith hath made thee whole. Lord, I thank you for this day and for this time we have for this passage. Lord, may we be, uh, be challenged by your word where your spirit would touch us today. Lord, may we live a, live a life that is in gratitude to you. In Jesus' name I ask. Amen. We just finished Thanksgiving, right? It's over and done with. Turkey leftovers, maybe a couple more days. And, and i got to be quite frank with you. I'm not a huge turkey fan. All right? I'm glad to get some amens out there, okay? You smoke it, you fry it, you bake it. End of the day, it's turkey. Right? Chicken takes on so many forms. You can have, you know, chicken cacciatore. You can have chicken tacos. And you can have uh, chicken parmesan. But turkey, what do you do with turkey? You eat it with stuffing and gravy. All right? Or put it on a sandwich. I, I thought I'd only order turkey one time at a restaurant, but my wife reminded me there's been two times that I can recall. One time was a Thanksgiving. We were down in Florida. We went to Cracker Barrel for Thanksgiving. They did a great job. Best Thanksgiving ever. No dishes. And one time I went to the turkey roost last year with the, with the senior saints. I ordered turkey at the turkey roost. But short of that, turkey is turkey. And it's Thanksgiving, and we, we look forward to it, and we enjoy the pecan pie, and we enjoy the mashed potatoes or, or rice. I prefer rice myself, uh, my Puerto Rican heritage there. And uh, maybe green bean casserole. Hopefully it took some time to give thanks. But this idea of gratitude should never stop being a reality in our life. Gratitude can transform the common days into thanksgiving. It can turn routine jobs into joy and change ordinary opportunities into blessings. Someone else said this, gratitude is a vaccine. By focusing on that which is praiseworthy, gratitude inoculates us against the disease of bitterness, resentment, and discontentment. I like the vaccine of gratitude it's easy to complain. You can wake up this morning, oh, there's ice out there, oh, there's snow out there, oh, it's cold out there. In the wintertime, it's too cold, in summer, it's too hot. Come on now. It's easy to complain, but gratitude is a vaccine. I'm going to ask us today to focus on gratitude toward God. What's on the screen? Black dot. A black dot. That can illustrate for a moment as we begin this sermon a problem in our life. Or if we can, all of our problems can fit inside that black dot. As bad as our life is, they can all fit into a small black dot. And the white background, if I can this morning illustrate God's provision for us, God's blessing to us, all the things He's done for us, let everything that, let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. We get so caught up in life and the problems of life, with the hardships of life. If I have a flat tire tomorrow, I'll say, oh man, it's going to be a bad day I had a flat tire. I don't remember the six years without a flat tire. I just remember the morning with a flat tire. Power went out last July. I still remember it here. I don't remember all the days that I have power. I don't recall that moment all the times that I do turn on the light switch and the lights turn on and the hot water heater supplies heat and the fridge supplies power. The power goes off. Oh my goodness, what's wrong with consumers? Don't they know I pay my bill every month? Easy to complain. I think one of the worst temporary illnesses is the stomach virus. Ones that causes you to vomit. I don't know of too many people who enjoy vomiting, throwing up. Sorry, I'll be careful how many times I use that because someone will probably throw up on me here now in church. I thankfully do not get sick very often. Those times you get sick and you get that rumbly stomach, you don't think, man, I, am, I have not had the stomach flu in five years. It's about time I got it. You think, oh my goodness, when will this ever be over? 
One time I had food poisoning. Brother Dalton and I had it the same night. That day, uh, Brother Dalton was kind enough to buy me lunch. Bought it from Wendy's. Bought me a, uh, a chili and a baked potato. <clears throat> it was a lunch of mine before, and I loved that. It was great, and I think you had the same thing, if I remember. And that night, from about 11 p.m. to about 2 in the morning, I lost 7 pounds. <laughs> I know that because I played basketball, I'd weighed myself, and the next morning I weighed myself again. 7 pounds I lost. That was horrible. At that moment, I didn't think about all the good times, all the nights I had full of sleep. I thought, this is horrible. And consequently, I don't like Brother Dalton at that moment. <laughs> it wasn't his fault. I do go back to Wendy's now. Why? Because I'm a glutton for punishment. But I see here in the passage someone who focused on the provision rather than the problem. The challenge is this morning to focus on the whiteness of God's blessing. Focus on the white space of God's provision. Focus on the white space of God's abundance rather than the black spot of a problem in your life. We look today at the finishing up the attitude of gratitude. I see a thankfulness in this passage, the thankfulness, verses 16 through 19, where it begins with the Samaritan fell on his face. He was so humbled, so thankful, that he did not even stand on his feet. He realized that this person was not any ordinary person. When was the last time you realized in a real way that Jesus is not an ordinary person? You say, well, every day, Pastor, I'll, do you really? Then why do you try to bargain with him? Lord, if you do this, I will. Lord, you, you let me win the lottery, and I will give 20% to First Baptist Church. Lord, if you help me find this right, if, if you work this out right here, jo my job right here, Lord, then I will be faithful to you. Why do we try to treat him like somebody who's ordinary? He is not ordinary. I see, first of all, this Samaritan, I believe he was thankful for life. Thankful for life. This man had a death sentence. Leprosy was an incurable disease. We could equate it really today, um, well, not really, but even to cancer today. Though even now they have some, some things they can do to mediate that. And back in the Bible times, this time frame, there was no cure for leprosy. It was not a matter of if you're going to pass away from it, but a matter of when. And this man had a second shot at life. Thankful for life. I think of Psalm 90, verse 12. So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. This man said, I want to live each day like it was my last day. His name, Steve Jobs, former employee of Apple. Someone said this, when it comes to stealing life, television beats tobacco hands down. When I read that, it caught my attention immediately. I don't own cigarettes, I do have a television. It says that a, that a lifelong smoker could expect to lose approximately eight years off their natural life. For each, I believe it's eight minutes for each, for each cigarette smoked. But on comparison, they said the television, on the other hand, robs us of time now. And back a few years ago, the average television viewing was 26 hours per week. And the average later on risen to 35 hours. All in all, you'll lose... 60 years, you can lose potentially 60 years of life watching TV. Now listen, I'm not here to, to smoke a TV on stage. There's some preachers who do that. They, they take a sledgehammer to a TV, All right? Probably for dramatic effect. I'm not saying you shouldn't watch football or, or baseball. But I am saying this Samaritan was thankful for life, and I doubt he valued life the same way as before. I wonder if he viewed life a little bit differently. I wonder if when he woke up that maybe, just maybe, he was thankful every single morning for a brand new day where he was not ridden with leprosy. Thankful for life. I wonder if his family was thankful for life. An attitude of gratitude. Thankful for life, but thankful for liberty. Thankful for liberty. Freedom from the disease. In the Bible, leprosy often is a form or, or a, a type or a, a picture of sin. Leprosy, the way it eats and the way it destroys, is comparing the Bible to sin in our life. I can't help but draw the conclusion that if we've trusted Christ as our Savior, 
our response ought to be the same as if we had a reality of leprosy, and that's to be on our hands and knees, our faces, saying, God, thank you for life, and thank you for liberty. You see, we were, we were dead, but now we're alive. We did have a death sentence, but now we have a life sentence, life in heaven with God forever. And though sin has affected all of us, Jesus still heals from sin. I'm so glad there's a day in my life when I trust Christ as my Savior. Six years old. I asked Jesus to forgive my sins and save me and take me to heaven. And I'm so glad that not only did I do that, but that He did that. See, there's a lot of people who pray for forgiveness of sins. A lot of religions in the world. And they will pray and do different things to find that freedom. Jesus is the only one that can bring it for real. An attitude of gratitude. When was the last time you said, Jesus, thank you for saving me? Thank you for my liberty that I have today. Thank you for the freedom I have from the sin of leprosy in my life. Lord, thank you for what you've done. You see, there's a thankfulness when I have an attitude of gratitude. Yet sometimes we're like, what did you do for me lately? I get after my kids sometimes. Got to be honest, I have three kids, and sometimes they forget to be grateful. Sometimes they take for granted life. Can you believe that? Must be their parents. We have those dad talks. Kids, you're not grateful for anything in life. Not true. That's how dads talk, right? That's it. You're getting nothing else in life till you're grateful. Another dad speech, right? I'm glad God is patient with us and merciful with us. I see thankfulness. And lastly, I see some thoughts for us this morning from this passage. Some thoughts to kind of encapsulate what Jesus did here with the leprosy. I'll share these few thoughts and we'll be done. First thought is this, just remember this, distance is no obstacle to the power of God. Distance is no obstacle to the power of God. In this passage, like we mentioned, Jesus just said to them, go, and, and they went. He didn't touch them. He, he didn't uh, do any dirt or anything. He just healed them. There's no problem with distance with God. I'm glad for that because I need him every single day. Sometimes we think, well, if I'm not close to him, he won't help me. And so I can't pray. I haven't been reading my Bible. I haven't been making good choices. You know that God loves you no matter what? The Bible says that before I loved him, he loved me. And the only reason I love him, we love him because he first loved us. Now, blessing follows obedience, but God's love is not contingent upon me. It's contingent upon him. And his power is not hindered by distance. There's no obstacle that's too far that God cannot handle. Whether he speaks, whether he touches, whether he moves, it can be done. Distance is no obstacle to the power of God. I wonder that day with the lepers what they intended God to do. You ever end up in a situation like myself where you pray for the answer and you have a good plan how God can solve the problem? Lord, here's my problem. I have this bill, and so, Lord, I need this overtime, and I need this to happen right here, and I need this to get on sale, and this problem is solved. Lord, please do that. Amen. I wonder what they anticipated that day. I wonder what, 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 what they thought. I wonder how he'll heal us. Will he touch you? Ooh, I hope he doesn't get leprosy. Will, will, he, will he throw some dirt? Will, will he touch his robe? Will he speak to us? Will he just, boom, will he have to dip in the Jordan River seven times? What will he have to do? And yet, Jesus made up his own way, like he always does. And I always like it the way that he makes up to solve a problem. It is always better than my way. When he gets involved, when Jesus gets involved, amazing things happen. I think about Lazarus who had passed away. Martha said, Lord, you should have come a little earlier. You could have healed him. Here's the way you could have solved the problem, Lord. And Jesus... No, no, no. I've got a better plan for you. We'll have him come walk out in his grave close. How's that for closure? Distance is no obstacle to the power of God. Second thought is this. Whatever the Lord asks us to do ought to be done. Whatever the Lord asks us to do ought to be done. You have to ask yourself with these lepers, what if they had not gone to the priest? Well, that's not how I want God to solve the problem. I'm not going to, I'm not clean. I can't show him I'm clean. I'm not clean yet. I know they would not have been healed. Because the Bible says as they went, they were healed. So if they had not gone, they had not went, they would not have been healed. They would have missed out 
on the greatest blessing to that point in their life that happened to them. Whatever the Lord asks ought to be done. The question is, are we listening and obeying? You're listening this morning, you're sitting here, and often is the case, it's not a knowing problem, but a doing problem. We had a great revival last week. I so appreciate Pastor Ledd and his tremendous messages. But it's not enough to listen, it's enough to do. As a man, we have this thing men called selective hearing. Not necessarily on command, it just kind of happens in life, right? And something else can be occupying our attention, and, and I can miss everything else going on in life. My kids can, can be burning down the house. The dog can be yipping, and if I'm looking at an electrical outlet, nothing else matters in life. I'm focused laser vision right here. If we're not careful, we apply that same thing to spiritual truths. All's going on in God's truth, but we're, we're not comprehending it. Whatever God asks us to do ought to be done. Third one is this. Gratitude to our Lord ought to be a normal response, not an exception. In this particular account, it was the exception. Ten men healed. One man responded. Someone has said that that's a typical uh, statistic. Ten percent of people are grateful. Impossible to prove. But I would say that there are less people who are thankful than are thankful. I think that's safe. It's easy to complain. Gratitude to our Lord ought to be a normal response, not an exception. Back in, uh, back in uh, September, we had school camp. At school camp, the Lord touched me about, about my devotions. I read my Bible. I read it through every 90 days. It's, it's what I do. I was talking to Brother Edwards at, at school camp, and he mentioned he had come across his wife's devotional journal. I highlight on my phone and make some notes and get some things ready, but he was encouraged by reading about his wife's devotional walk after she had passed, probably a year, about half a year after she passed or so, or a little, a little longer than that, I think. The Lord touched my heart and, and then touched me in a way that said, J.D., you know, if you passed, what would your kids read about you? So I went out there, bought a journal I've been writing down, so if, not that they'll ever want to read it, but they have some, uh, some record, not just a digital record. One thing I've added every single day, which I did before, was to write down blessings every single day. You ever try to write down blessings? Besides Thanksgiving Day? And I'm not talking about blessings like, wow, I just got a new pair of socks. Like, Lord, this is what you did yesterday. I saw your hand at work. You see, gratitude to our Lord ought to be a normal response, not an exception. We ought to wake up and say, God... Thank you for what you've done yesterday, what you've already done this morning. I tell you what, I, I like to look back and see, look at look what the Lord did two weeks ago. I may think I remember well, but I don't remember well. I look back and I see, wow, that's right, you did do that. That's right, you did work that out. That, that's right, you did solve that problem that I thought was huge. And you took care of just like that. Gratitude to our Lord ought to be a normal response, not an exception. Next one is this one. Gratitude is more than a feeling, but an action. I, I tell you what, I, I, uh, I get a little tired of this thing, this, this whole feeling mentality. Oh, I just feel happy. I feel grateful. Well, great. Why don't you let somebody know? All right, don't just hide it on the inside. Don't hide it from the Lord. It ought to be more than a feeling, but an action. The last one is this one. Gratitude begins today. Someone said this, consider the last time you opened a can of beans. Did you think about who planted them? Who picked them? Who packed them? Who shipped them? Who stocked them? Who sold them? The question is, no. We just open the can of beans and throw it in a bowl and toss it in the microwave, grab a fork and eat the beans. We don't see the chain, we just see the beans. I wonder about the last time that God did something for us, do we just see the beans. You want to see God's hand at work? At work. Remember one morning I was driving to work. I was in a Honda Civic. I stopped at the corner of Dixie and King Road coming across Dixie Highway. The light turned green and for some reason I did not speed through the intersection on green. I'm normally a green as go kind of guy. All right, I'm not like to hesitate, but I paused for just a moment. As I paused, 
a waste management truck came barreling through the intersection. My heart began to race like maybe yours has before, where you realize you were that close to seeing your maker. Accident? No. Hand of God? Thank you, Lord. Thank you. The chain? Do we just see the beans? Someone said this, complaining is like bad breath. You notice it when it comes out of someone else's mouth, but not when it comes out of your own. Don't forget Romans chapter 1. When it talks about what happens when people turn away from God, it says when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were they thankful. What do you look at? The white or the black dot? This particular leper, after he was healed, he saw the white space. And he said, God, I can't help but fall on thy face and say thank you. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for what you've given to us. Lord, the reality is any problem we have pales in comparison to your provision and your blessing to us. Lord, touch us, convict us, show us ways that we have been ungrateful, how we've lived in unthankfulness. Lord, turn our hearts towards you. The one who was here this morning who said, Pastor, how would you pray for me? As you spoke, God spoke to me this morning. I want to have that attitude of gratitude. Would you pray for me this morning that I would look at what God has done, not at the problems in my life? Would you pray for me this morning? Slip your hand up, slip back down. We'll see you. Amen. Amen. I want to have that attitude of thankfulness, that attitude of gratitude. Who else? Been raised before, raise it now. Amen. 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 I wonder if you're here today and you don't know that you have a home in heaven. I wonder if you're here and you've never trusted Christ as your Savior. You never asked Jesus to save you. This morning, something going on in your heart. You said, Brother Howell, I'm not sure I'm on my way to heaven, but I'd like to be sure. When you pray for the others, would you pray for me? Just slip your hand up and slip back down. I've never trusted Christ as my Savior, and I'll draw no more attention to you than I did to anyone else, but we'd love to pray for you this morning. Say, Pastor, how would you pray for me? I'm not sure I'm on my way to heaven, but I'd like to be sure. Would you pray for me when you pray for this? Just slip your hand up and slip back down. We'll see it. Amen, I see that. Lord, thank you for this time. Lord, thank you. Guide this invitation. May we respond the way we ought to to you, in obedience to you. In Jesus' name.